Well, thank you for coming tonight. My name is Justin Shubo. I am president of the National Civic Art Society. We are delighted you could join us for this evening to hear Sabin Howard present his magnificent classical design for the National World War I Memorial. Founded in 2002, the National Civic Art Society educates and empowers our leaders in the promotion of public art and architecture worthy of our great republic. We do so by advocating for the classical tradition in civic design. We believe that that tradition is unparalleled in its dignity, beauty, and harmony, not to mention its legibility to the common man. It is no accident that the Founding Fathers chose the classical style when designing the nation's capital and its core buildings of government. The founders sought to harken back to Republican Rome and Democratic Athens, and they knew that classical architecture was time-honored and timeless. The National Civic Arts Society works to continue and expand upon the founders' vision for the nation's capital and federal design generally. I perhaps don't need to tell you that since the 1950s, Washington, D.C. has been marred and disfigured by federal buildings and memorials that do not comport with the city's classical heritage and identity. For instance, there is the Hirschhorn Museum, which looks like a gunslit bunker, and then there is the brutalist FBI building, which I call the Ministry of Fear. <laughs> At the same time, some of our national memorials are not only not classical, they do not reflect the consensus view of the subject commemorated. For example, the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial is wholly secular, a socialist realist work that fails to include the Reverend's most famous lines, such as, I have a dream. More recently, the Eisenhower Memorial under construction, a memorial to a traditional and modest president, is a gargantuan deconstructionist assemblage of towering cylindrical pillars and an unintelligible woven steel screen that is bigger than the Hollywood sign in Los Angeles. Ever since the construction of Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial, a memorial to an admittedly divisive war, the general trend in America is that memorials must not evince signs of valor or heroism. As an egregious case in point, the United Flight 93 Memorial in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, fails to commemorate the heroism of the passengers on that flight. This is the case despite the fact that those passengers likely saved the plane from crashing into a core building of government. Instead of being commemorated as heroes, the passengers are remembered as nothing but victims. As you'll see tonight, the new World War I Memorial breaks that trend. While it rightfully acknowledges the magnitude of the suffering and loss in the war, at the same time, it depicts the soldier's bravery in the crucible of battle. It is not yet another victim memorial. And at the same time, it tells the story of a country on the rise, confident and powerful. But it is more than that. The memorial is monumental and beautiful and sends a clear, patriotic, and compelling message with easily comprehensible symbolism and allegory. We hope it will set a new trend in American commemorative works. You might ask, how did such a design come to be selected? The answer lies in great part to the fact that the World War I Centennial Commission chose to hold an open, blindly reviewed design competition that unlike some other competitions, was not biased against classical design in favor of modernism and postmodernism. The competition jury was also carefully selected and the leadership of the commission played a crucial role. They are to be heartily commended. And speaking of such leadership, I now turn things over to Edwin Fountain, Vice Chairman of the World War I Centennial Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And, uh, and thank you for the stimulating conversations we had along the way before and during the, uh, the, the competition and selection process. Um, uh, you're not here to listen to me. Saban's much more interesting, and what he has to show you is, is much more interesting than, than what I can. But I want to talk to you about the process that, that led to Saban's selection as the sculptor for the, for the, for the World War I Memorial. Um, this here, this is, the, this is the rendering of the overall memorial site. And if you don't know where it is, this is Pershing Park uh, across the street from the Willard Hotel. 
at the far end of Pennsylvania Avenue, just one block from the White House. Uh, it was an existing memorial to General John J. Pershing, the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces in World War I. And this was the site that Congress authorized us to redevelop as the National World War I Memorial. And in undertaking that project, we, had, we began with, with three constraints. Uh, the first was, as you see, this has to be not just a memorial, but a memorial within a well-functioning urban park. So unlike the Korean Memorial, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which are standalone memorials in a, in a, in a blank space of grass, uh, here we had to also serve a civic park function, which helped channel the ultimate, ultimate selections we made. Uh, the site itself was, is within a very complex urban environment. Uh, the neighbors to this site are the Willard Hotel, the Washington, the, the Washington Hotel, the Sherman Memorial across 15th Street, the Department of Commerce, the, the Wilson District Building, Freedom Plaza, and the JW Marriott. Very distinct and different uh, urban structures, urban spaces. Uh, this site had to harmonize and, and, and be, in, in, in be complementary uh, to those sites. And then a third constraint that developed along the way was that we were instructed to preserve the existing park. Uh, that in itself is, a, is an interesting object lesson in modernist design of urban landscapes. Uh, we resisted, but, but uh, had ultimately to yield to the inevitable. And so we had to work within the contours of that existing park. And that, that further drove our, our, constraint, uh, our, our channeled our selection. So that meant that, that a memorial based on an architectural form uh, was pretty much a non-starter. That would just never work in, in, a, in a site like this. Uh, and it meant that in the end, there were a lot of very interesting designs that we looked at that ultimately uh, were discarded. Uh, about, about two of the five finalists, I said, I would love to see this park built, but just not here, not on Pennsylvania Avenue, not in this part of the District of Columbia. Well, within those constraints, uh, we then had a, we had a two two key and related choices uh, at the at the inception of the memorial development process. The first, as as Justin alluded to, was, do we go by open competition or do we have some sort of pre-screened competition, uh, either where we, where we have a request for portfolios and then select designers with the design to come later, uh, or do we choose an, a number of established firms uh, with a track record in these kinds of projects? Uh, and then invite them to, to submit their design concepts and proceed from there. That's largely what happened in the Eisenhower Memorial Project. Uh, we had closely studied that, uh, largely agreed with the critiques that Justin and the National Civic Art Society made about that process, and frankly, uh, were, you know, thought the Vietnam Veterans Memorial competition was a success story. Um, and so we went on, on that route for a variety of reasons. The second choice was whether to put our thumb on the scale, whether to prescribe certain parameters in terms of uh, the form or the style of the memorial uh, at the outset of this open uh, blind competition. Did we want to prescribe that it would be in one particular motif or another? Did we want to prescribe that it would have these elements or, or whatnot? And in the end, we opted to, to leave all that relatively unstated. We wanted uh, a variety, uh, a breadth of memorial concepts because we didn't know what might be out there. And so we did not come into this pre prejudging that it would be a, a, a classical or a figurative design. My own personal inclination was, was in that direction, but we were humble enough to know that we didn't know what we might want and we wanted to throw the field open to, to see what might come in the door. Ultimately, we, we, we received 360 submissions from around the world uh, I learned in this process that Chinese architects entered these design competitions in droves. I was very nervous that we might have one or two Chinese submissions. Uh, I suspect that they were among the more, uh, what's the word, um, creative solutions that uh, de defied certain laws of gravity and physics. Um, and in the end, we wound up with, with five U.S.-based firms, which I was pleased by, but that was not a prerequisite. Uh, there was one submission that I remember that had an absolutely beautiful rendering uh, of a sculpture in the round, um, uh, just exquisitely done, uh, that we paid a lot of attention to, but ultimately discarded in part because it rested within an architectural form that, that again, was just not appropriate for the site. Uh, but the sculpture itself, it was, it was wrong in theme, um, uh, but the skill and artistry of the, of the sculpture was undoubted. And, and I learned later that that sculptor was Saban Howard, uh, but we rejected his submission. So we had five finalists. 
And I'll skip over that process, although I do want to call out Joe Weishar. Joe, where are you? Joe, stand up. Joe is the architect who won the design competition. And what, and what Joe did was come up with the, 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 the park solution. Uh, and, 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 and he contemplated about 300 linear, linear feet of bas-relief sculpture. He photoshopped reference samples uh, to show what it might be, but he didn't attempt to depict, you know, to, to, to depict a particular narrative or set of images or whatnot. It was, it was just sort of a insert sculpture here uh, approach to the design. But the jury and, and saw the merit to that and, and it appealed to the commission as well. Um, and one of the selling points was that opportunity that it afforded for a large figure to sculpture. Now, why was that important to us? For, to me at least, and I think to the commission, uh, it was for a number of reasons. The first was for commemorating, commemorating an event that happened 100 years ago. We wanted to, the memorial to be of the time that it commemorated. Although all the veterans of that war had long passed, but not long, but, but had passed by the time we embarked on this memorial, uh, we wanted it to be recognizable to the, to, the, to the participants in the conflict that it was commemorating. The second is more than the other national war memorials that we have on the Mall. Uh, World war, a World War I memorial needs an educational, a very strong educational element. Um, I happen to like the Vietnam Veterans Memorial a great deal, as do many others. But it and the World War II Memorial, in a very different way, they are both abstract memorials. The viewers today do not need to be told what those war was or wars were about or what the, what the wars mean. Although I query 50 years from now uh, what someone will make of this massive black wall with 55,000 names inscribed on it and wonder why was that memorial form chosen. But World War I, given it's, it's, it's the lack of a place that that war has in American memory and American cultural consciousness, there needed a narrative element to convey the significance of the war in American and, and world history, to convey the magnitude of the American service and sacrifice in that war, which was the third bloodiest war in our history. Uh, the, 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 the deaths in that, the American deaths in that war, exceeding those in Vietnam and Korea combined. Um, there needed to be an educational and narrative component to this memorial that conveyed that, 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 that inspired further self-education on those points. And it needed a visual element um, we've seen dozens of movies about the Civil War and about Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. We've seen dozens of movies and television miniseries and TV shows about World War II, be it Band of Brothers or The Longest Day or Saving Private Ryan. Uh, we saw MASH. The Vietnam War came to us through our TV sets. We don't have in our collective memory that visual representation of World War I. Uh, we needed to show that that war was every bit as savage and bloody and our soldiers every bit as heroic and courageous as those in other wars that we commemorate. And only figurative sculpture would do that, we felt. And so the educational and the visual components combined in this cinematic narrative that Sabin will, will show you in a moment, which shows in an impressionistic way what the war looked like and also tells the story of the American experience of the war. And so why, that's why that memorial, that, that's why Joe's design appealed to us. Now, in the second stage of the competition, we said to Joe, you know, it might help if you went out and found a sculptor. So Joe went to the sculptural yellow pages and found Sabin Howard. Uh, and Sabin, uh, and Joe obviously saw what we saw, which is just based on his portfolio, uh, Sabin is one of the finest figurative sculptors working in the world today. Um, uh, I, I did not come prepared, unfortunately, to give you his bio. He was raised in Italy, which gave him an unfair head start uh, in terms of training as a classical sculptor. Uh, he has studied and taught in Philadelphia and elsewhere around the country, uh, has been a practitioner of this form for 30 years. Uh, as you'll see in his work, it's absolutely exquisite. What we were looking at was these very Greco-Roman looking nude torsos that he, that he did. Uh, and here we were asking him to expand from single forms to what ultimately became a 38-figure work uh, rather than static forms uh, in very classical poses, going to this very kinetic, violent, turbulent, uh, interlocking uh, groups of figures that were far beyond what he had done to that point. Had I known what a gamble we were taking at the time, uh, I'm not sure we would have had the nerve to do it, but he has repaid that gamble in spades. Uh, and so without further ado, um, 
And I'll start with there, Saban, and then you can go. I'll turn it over to Saban Howard. All right. Thank you for coming tonight. So let me give you a taste of where I started and where my mind was before the project and where it progressed through the project because I was unprepared for this project when it began. And as the title is so aptly named, A Soldier's Journey, it's a hero's journey. And I really had to grow with the project to be able to pull off something of such magnitude that would appeal to not only Washington, but also the world, because the world comes to Washington to learn about the history of this country. As Edwin so aptly stated, I began as a classicist and worked um, out of a studio in the South Bronx until Joe sent me a very polite email on September 14th <laughs> asking me to partner up with him, and I did. So I was doing figures that were very static and um, esoteric, and I'm just going to run through these so you get an idea of what I was doing. But I was casting in bronze, and bronze beats mortality. It's a way to create something that outlasts everybody in the room. I learned uh, my craft and my art in Italy. Um, I'm half Italian. My mother's Italian. My father's American. And my education came from a man who came out of the Bauhaus school in Germany. And that element about structure of the figure and how the figure is developed as an architectural system using organic forms is how I perceived reality. So my education had a large part in how I see reality. So I'm showing you these because this is how I think. And the way that I saw a single figure was the way that I eventually was able to compose a composition with 38 figures. I might add that that composition that we finally came up with wasn't the first one. It was around the 18th one. <laughs> and there were quite a lot of meetings that I drove back to New York to um, rebuild and start from scratch. These are anatomical drawings that um, you can see I'm thinking well below the surface of the human body. And there, there are a couple things that really inform my work. First and foremost, like Edwin said, what are we depicting? Human beings. We're depicting the human experience. We're showing what it means to be human. It, it, that's a pretty deep statement, because you don't see a lot of that these days. There's not a lot of figurative art out there. Everything's very abstract. And the other element is everything is enhanced. And reality is enhanced by digital technology. So this is the journey that I wanted to talk to you about tonight. These are some of the drawings that I was doing before, where I used actual people. This is a uh, man, Mark, from the South, uh, from Throg's Neck in um, New York. This is the structural element that I apply to my thought process. This is a way of observing reality and transferring it into the art realm. So here's the project that we finally have in front of us. We didn't start here. It's been a long journey, actually. And I realized today was the first time I drove to Washington, and I didn't have to go to a bureaucratic meeting. And I was <laughs> really relieved. It's the first time that I actually had a little bit of joy in the car. I'm very honest. <laughs> So I got this project, and I thought, OK, wh where do I go? What do I look for? And I used the same way of creating art, my methodology, that I had for the previous um, 30 years. I went to the computer, and I looked for pictures of real people, and what did they look like? What was the emotion that was there? So I, I started finding imagery that actually made me realize how human this war was. The girl with the hat reminds me of my daughter. The soldiers above remind me of my friends that I rock climbed with. And I began to realize that there's a common thread here to 
to what I'd been doing. So when you get into a project like this, this there are a lot of voices. Edwin suggested perhaps that I look for a figure that reminded him of Dan Daly, the famous Marine. I found this picture and I sent it to him. So a dialogue begins. So you're not working in the studio by yourself. You're engrossed in this conversation with thousands of people and it can all be rather confusing, especially when this is a very foreign subject to you. World War I was not really taught to me besides a European history class and it didn't have the sort of depth that I might have for American history or other elements of history. And so I'm looking at these images and I'm beginning to realize that there's something really painful going on here. So this was my first attempt. Um, this was the architectural element with the sculptures underneath. And that, was, uh, that began in 2015. Um, then entering with Joe, I did these drawings. And there are a couple things that I chose and looked for. A low eye level, giving a monumental feel, a very dynamic quality to the figures. But this was not really the direction that we were going to take. So this was in uh, 2016 in January. I looked a lot younger back then. <laughs> <laughs> you did too, Joe. <laughs> um, it's really been quite an epic voyage. Edwin and I talked a bit, and one of the things that really pushed him and inspired him was this piece by Schrady, the sculptor who created this in front of the Capitol building. I don't know if you're aware of this, but this took 20 years to create, the two sculptures. And then he died two weeks before the unveiling. So that's a testament to the amount of energy that is necessary to create something of, of such importance and grandeur. But I, I, I looked at this. And this is not what I was doing. I was doing something that was static and not really available to the general public. So I needed to change my methodology of creating art so that the person or the visitor to the memorial seeing my work would be sucked in and have a, a visceral reaction. And that's the task that was laid in front of me. It's like, let's make something that will have a direct impact on people and they'll go home and they'll want to learn more and, 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 and get involved in this in an emotional fashion. So why am I showing The Last Judgment? Because through this, I guess the first three or four months of the project, I'm hearing, well, you need to put some horses in, you need to put some tanks in, you need to put barbed wire in, you need to, the list is, is really long. It's a, beyond a dozen. We're hearing that from me. Yeah. But it's, it's, it creates a lot of confusion in an artist, especially in, some, in a topic that you're not working on, and then all of a sudden you're thrown into it. So I went into my loo in my studio, and I hear this voice in my head. And I don't always hear voices in my head. But this day I did, and it was like, do what you know, and that's what I know. I know Italian Renaissance art, and I know The Last Judgment, and I know the figure. And so by looking at that, I saw this pretzel of humanity. It's all these figures all intertwined. And they're not individualistic. They're not alone. They're not alienated. They're all connected. And so it began to dawn on me that if I made a relief that had figures that were moving forward and backwards, advancing and receding in space, you would create something way more dynamic. So I began designing, and my first attempts were rather, um, I'm searching for the word, bad, poor. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to show you, this was the first attempt. I want to show you the process. It's going to take a second to load. I have the versions here. I did 18 versions. I took over 12,000 pictures. <sighs> over, I guess it was nine months. And what I began to do is I began to work using a cell phone where I would use the burst. You know how you press the button and it will capture a movement. 
I began to do that. So the actors were no longer posing on the stand. They were in movement, acting something out. And then I would do the burst and I would get 12 frames through that movement. And all of a sudden we're telling a story. So story has always been a really big part of my family. My wife is a novelist. And the influence began to really creep in more and more. And I began to realize that's the missing element to your work. You need to have a story behind the structural aspect. And you need to create a story that is universal. And it's also my personal story as an artist, because I need to be able to get behind it. So here we go. <laughs> this is the first one that I brought. I think it was April of 2016. And this is just so incredibly static. And it's a, it's a giant mess. I'll, I'm going to enlarge it a little bit so you can see and I'll scroll across. I, this is like the line at the supermarket. It's just like <laughs> never ending. And there's, it's, there's no meaning here. So here's the family. OK, now they're going off to war. And look at the posing. It's, it's, not, it's a little bit stagey, right? So I'm showing you, you this to, to show you my honesty in my process and how much I had to grow to get to the place on the other side. This is the battle scene. OK, come on, guys. That's the battle scene. I know. So I get one figure in here who has some, a little bit more action. And then here's the cost of war. And here's the return home. And then the final scene is my daughter. So the, the only thing that remained from this initial scene is the image of my daughter at the end. Now I'm going to whiz through as we progressed. So this is, I'll go slow and then we'll. Now here we're starting to get a little bit better on the, um, the left with this, this, this idea remained. This idea remained. And then this whole section was cut out. Some of the poses remained. But then look, at, look, look what happens here. There's a pose with this model. This is James. I heard a story from James. James was a, 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 he's a Brit. And his family was personally involved in World War I. His great great grandfather died, his great uncle served and came back when with his service revolver shot his wife, shot himself and shot his daughter. And that's when I began to realize this is the gravitas that you need to show to other people. So without, without going through too much of this, I started posing. You can see how we're getting closer. OK, so if I enlarge this. And I'll whiz through that. OK, here we go. Now we're starting to get someplace. This was the beginning of where we were going. And you can see the, the kinetic energy. But there's still some confusion with figures facing each other. But then, OK, here's the cost of war. And Edwin again had an idea. Why don't you have a figure coming directly out? There's a lot of suffering here. Again, the end is the same. So I will continue a little bit faster because the lecture has a lot of elements. Until we arrived, I've reversed the figure in the middle. So he's now leading the charge. And you can see how this becomes more cohesive. And the reason I showed you the anatomical stuff is because you have a hierarchy when you construct a figure of many elements. The skeleton is the architecture, and the muscles are the energy that spirals around and forces the architecture to move. So in some ways, I'm an architect working with organic form. And so when you make a single figure, it has many units, and all those units have their specific importance. And that has to create one unit, which is one figure. So here you have to create one composition with many elements. How do you do that? And that's what I learned how to do. Well, at the end of this nine-month process with Edwin and his commission, no, that's not me. 
we got to a drawing. And I remember sitting with Edwin at the Barnes & Noble down on 14th Street, Union, Union Square, New York City, and Edwin said, okay, go ahead and do the drawing. And, and I was so relieved that I had gotten, we had gotten here to this place. But I also want to say that I think as an artist, it's critical to go through this process of commissions because it takes you outside of yourself and, cre and, and, and forces you to grow in ways that you wouldn't because they're so uncomfortable. There's a lot of looking in the mirror and saying, okay, what do I improve here? <coughs> and there's a dozen people at that table and you need to, to hold on to your idea of what the vision is and also at the same time work with them. And that's something that I don't think happens very often because sometimes artists will give in and say yes, yes, yes to everybody and then the whole vision falls apart. And I'm very stubborn and I have a very clear vision sometimes. And so this was something that really was a balance between a democratic concept of a lot of uh, concepts and ideas from a group and then trying to hold on to a vision. And that's a very tricky subject to deal with. So here's our final image. Okay, let's go now to... All right, so... I'm going to run through the next slides to show you what this burst idea with the camera and what it does. Do you see that? That's what we're doing. So we're capturing a single image. And this is how technology comes into play in the, the image capturing. Um, it's about movement. Nothing is static. And, and what I was doing before, everything is stacked. The ribcage and the pelvic block are all vertical. Now all of a sudden, there's a diagonal to the figures. And the diagonal, the more it increases, the more the kinetic energy increases, and the higher the, the feeling of energy is. So in our relief, we have a whole plethora of feelings and emotions that describe the war, they describe humanity, and they describe who we are as human beings. So here, here is the story that my wife informed me one day at the breakfast table called A Hero's Journey. And it is a soldier's journey. It's a call to adventure. Um, and then the next section is entering into, you cross a threshold and enter into a challenge and um, temptation. Here it's the war. And then abyss and death is the very center of the composition, followed by transformation, atonement, or and then return. And then that return comes full circle. So I did not know I was doing this. But I began to realize, after my wife talked to me, she educates me quite a bit, that Hero's Journey is in every single culture of the world, in every single time frame of the world. And there is not a single part of society that has not used this template for telling the tale of, of um, the hero. This is a diagram of a soldier's journey. And you can see there's a, big, a very clear beginning, a middle, and an end. And if you can look in the middle of that, you can see the X. The X is a symbol for transformation and change. And that was, again, something that I had not planned. Um, obviously, World War I transformed the planet and the world and society on so many levels. For one, it was the end of figurative art and the beginning of modernism. And it's ironic that this project, which follows the war 100 years later, is figurative. The figures also took on more meaning than just being a soldier and a family going to war. It's an allegory. So you have three different stories. You have a family story of an an allegory of the United States, and you have a mythological story as well. Well, after the drawing was done, we needed to make a sculpture, and I traveled 9,000 miles away to make that sculpture over six months. And in so doing, I had to start again with a, a different system to create the first maquette, which was a 10-foot maquette with 12-inch high figures. 
We reshot all the figures in the round, numbered each of the figures, and then began something which I'd never dwelled in before. It's the digital world of the figure. I'd done everything traditionally. I'd had a model, I had lighting, I had tools that were used by sculptors 2,000 years ago, and clay. I, I didn't know how to do this programming on a computer with ZBrush. So I end up in a digital um, movie making company because they had a full boutique um, organization where you could hire sculptors, uh, mold the piece after it was sculpted, cast it, and ship it. And from that, we went through, and I had to discuss with them, how do you deal with placing figures together on a screen and not losing the proportions of the drawing. The drawing is perspectival. The eye level is around the knees. So everything above is reduced spatially from below. So the figures look much larger than they actually are. We did milling and tests in the first month to figure out the depth of the, of the relief. These milling tests explained to us very quickly that if we wanted something that was highly emotional, we had to go deeper for greater impact. And then also, if this is to be seen from 175 feet away, you need to do something that has really dark darks and light lights. So it really pops off the background. So I'm working in the template of the Roman sarcophagus. And some of those are, what, eight or nine feet long, and they might have 25 figures. That's what I was working with. And from there, this was our final print. From here, we digitalized that and cut the whole, all these figures up into 120 sections. Those 120 sections in plastic were shipped to China, printed in China, and then shipped back to New Zealand, where they were molded. This is the pink stuff. It's not frosting on a cake. And then transferred to a clay. The clay was then assembled. And this is, these, these are digital. So you, they have a very mannequin-like flavor to them. I'm going to go faster through this because I want to show you more of the actual monument, but just to give you an idea of how labor intensive it is to create something of this. That's the scale. Those are all the hands and guns. So this all has to reoccur at full scale. All right, do you see how slick this looks? It looks like there's no sense of um, human fingerprint. It looks, that's the digital fingerprint. And that's what most art is that's figurative today. It's done using a mechanical device, the computer, to mill out the figures. And something is lost. So I took this and I sculpted for 71 days straight and transferred it back into a feeling that an artist or a human hand had done it. That's me after 71 days. <laughs> yes. What is that thing you said, the thousand yard stare? In a way, I had PTSD. I experienced PTSD, but not to the same level as men on the battlefield. But the intensity of this will play with your, a, with your head and scramble your brain. These are my final pictures. So then now this is cut into sections, deassembled, and again you go through the same process of molding. And you now cast in resin, and then you reassemble this. We spray painted that and sent this back to the United States for a meeting, was it 2018? In February, February. That didn't go so well. <laughs> well, we then did a bunch of other meetings with the Commission of Fine Arts that lasted till the following year and then I was asked to reduce the relief, and in reducing the relief from 75 feet to 
our eventual 60 feet, the composition got tighter, more dramatic, and more energetic. And again, I looked towards technology. How do we do this quickly? I had now four months to redo the whole composition and start the process of thinking ahead to the monument. I went to this place in the UK called Pangolin. Pangolin works with Damien Hurst, and they are basically the most cutting edge uh, foundry in Europe. This is a photogrammetry machine, which sets up 160 cameras around the model. You put the models on the inside, you pose them, and now, from here, you get a print that it's a three-dimensional image. So this is the same moment historically as we had when photography was invented, except now it's three-dimensional. So a lot of people that are classically trained are saying, this is the death of us all. I'm going to argue that it's not. I'm, I'm going to argue that this enables us to make larger projects, but they have to be driven by traditional values and the ability to use your hands, your heart, and your brain to create art. So the education that I received is invaluable for using this technology to create things that are really dynamic and human. That's a print on the screen. That's the amount of detail that you can get from the photogrammetry machine. It's, it's fabulous, but it's also a temptress. It's deceptive because it's all surface. It doesn't have a lot to do with structure. And structure is what gives feeling and the sense of humanity to sculpture and art. So I'm going to rush through these. So you can see this is how something is done. It's cut in half and reassembled. That's the top. That's the bottom. We did a, uh, this, these are one inch figures. This was a test print. And this was eventually the maquette scale that we showed to the Fine Arts Committee Commission. So this is the final assembly of last year in, in, in March. And then this was um, cast in resin and uh, quickly patinaed with a base and shipped over uh, to Washington from Stroud, which is in the Cotswolds in the UK. So from here, we eventually passed through the Commission of Fine Arts, and I'm very grateful for that. I wouldn't ever want to go through that again. <laughs> but uh, I learned a lot from it. And I think this is a really interesting project, as Edwin was talking about. And I'm going to th jump into the last segment of this and show you then the actual memorial being built. Uh, there's a sense of sacredness to the project where uh, the figures are slightly overscale. They're six foot six. Some of them are slightly larger because they're not standing upright, they're crouching, so they would be around seven foot two, but they are bursting at the seams of the frame. So they are larger than life. So when you walk along from left to right and you look at these groups and scenes, you realize that there's, there's something very heroic and monumental to this uh, achievement of these men going into battle and then returning. And it speaks well of humanity. It speaks also of heroism, that we are able to rise to the occasion faced with great odds. And that fit very, very well with the way I was working before with my creation of figures like Apollo or uh, Mars or some of the female figures, like Aphrodite. This is the actual memorial milled out in the foundry. And it looks great in a photo from a distance. But when you see it up close, and I'll show you closer images, it's still mannequin-like. So this is the first print. And this gets shipped 
and arrives in New Jersey at my studio in Englewood, where it is unloaded and reassembled. The studio also was created to make use of natural light so that it would not be sculpted under incandescent light, so that it would have the impact outside because it was created in the same sort of environment. This is the studio in progress, and you can see here our models. We are working from models. Most people are working today from photographs and from computer screens. And it gets really dangerous when you do that because those are flat images. Those are, those are references that have no feelings, that do not breathe, that do not have any sense of expansion. Okay? So when I look at a model, I am using my anatomical knowledge to take that, translate that into an art form. And one of the big things that I'm looking for is how do I subdivide the figure into the surfaces and each one of those little sections. Do you know when you go to the butcher and you see the picture of the cow and it's all mapped out, you have your rump steak, you know, all these sections, that's called mapping out. I map out the figure using my anatomical knowledge as the grammar for discerning what I'm seeing. And when I do that, each one of those sections is a convexity. It's pressing out into space. So that is a symbol for who we are as human beings. We're bursting with life. We have energy that's pushing out. When we die, the energy or the pressure is gone. And we, on the one hand, you would have, I'm going to make an analogy, a grape turns into a raisin. It just shrinks in on itself. It collapses. So the sculpture from my concept is about this massive amount of energy pushing out not only at the viewer, but progressing towards the future from left to right. So we sculpt from life 40 hours a week. The other sculptors are learning. And we're on target in terms of time. By next August, we'll be sending the first section to be cast at the foundry. And I wanted to show you some of the um, last, uh, spent 12 weeks of sculpting now. For example, in the initial scene where the father is being held back by the mother, who is an allegory for the United States or America, here's the father. Who, I put a C clamp on his coat and recreated the same sort of tension of his coat being pulled off his body as he pulled forward to join his comrades at arm. These are the uh, attention to details that will be the narrative for the visitor to understand and tell the story through artistic merit. Not a book, but visual format. That's rare these days. The book has become more important than the visual format. So this was uh, the father figure, and I worked on that for four weeks, taking elements such as the coat and pushing the sense of stretch that these men had to go through, increasing the tension in the jaw. And I work with the anatomy to structure things out so I can understand what's going on. This is one of the models. The models are transformed into these characters. This is another model. This is the mother figure in the initial scene. This is the diagramming that I talked to you about, the idea of convexity. So there might be concavities in the body, but you don't think that because if you do, then you're pressing things in. That's what we get. That's the digital part. It's a mannequin. It has no energy in it. But it's a fantastic armature to put the clay on and begin the artistic process at scale. We went to a tailor and recreated the same sort of costumes that were used in, the, in that day and age. And then we apply clay with our hands. And we diagram, and we create rhythms and, and movements 
that are a translation from reality. And that, that what you're seeing right there is to tell the story. It's done not for a Chanel commercial beauty's sake, but it's done to tell a story that will impact that eighth grader when he walks by so that he will get very interested in something that happened 100 years ago. This is the foam and clay from an afternoon of chopping where it's cut off and reformed. And this is a diag uh, uh, to show you a little bit about the rhythms and the diagrams, you can see how, okay, for example, deltoid, tricep, um, extensors, the, these curves are very much the way art was once taught and now has been eliminated in art schools because for the most part, figurative art is relegated to a three hour block in uh, an art student's career. See the dynamic action? Nothing is still. So our models are suffering right now. They're not just standing around, they're actually in motion. And there's a lot of grumbling going on, but it's working. Gives you an idea of the alteration. The way that the calf bulges, the way that the Achilles heel is tense, the glutes and their tightness, and then the quads, and then the sense of a rib cage and the terrace major coming into the deltoid and how the arm flows out from the back. That's what we're looking at. This is me teaching one of my assistants. So this is what we started from. And this is what the template is to play forward. This is a Native American Indian from the Cherokee tribe who we went out, my wife and I went out to um, find a Native American who would come model for us. And then one of the people that I really admire and respect and hope to play forward the message that he left us with the Medici tomb, it's Michelangelo. But there's a sense of great dignity even to this foot and this back. And you can see the fullness and the energy that's there. And that's what Washington needs from my viewpoint, a sense of dignity because art is a representation of your culture and I don't want to be represented by cinder blocks. So I wanted to show you something that happened in the final stage last week. So do you see, let me engage you in the three figures that are standing so as we move into the fuller scales, we have much more to work with and the story gets a lot deeper. So here is the wife who is also an allegory for America. We were reluctant to enter into this war. And here is the husband who also represents America and the hero. So he pulls away from her and he is caught in the middle between the Brotherhood of Arms and his family. And I want you to look at, this has just started, but if I show you the faces, they begin to tell a story. The wife is the beginning of beauty, we're not there yet. There's a fierce charge in this soldier and this Brotherhood of Arms figure carries the anger and hatred of war, and the aggression that is necessary to survive and win. These soldiers here are different types. They're not all generic. This man was selected specifically for his ethnic background. It's African-American here as well, wearing a French hel helmet. And then the, we did not wear putties when we went into war. We wore um, gaiters. And so the attention to detail is beginning to come out at this scale. The cartridge belts as well have to be developed. They're full, they're not empty. 
And here's the dress that was designed for the project and the shirt as well. <laughs> This is last week, we got our next shipment. This is at the foundry, and the battle scene was the next shipment. This is the maquette that we used to put this together. So do you understand how deep this is on so many levels? My wife acts as my project manager, as my partner, for all the logistics that are involved in this project. It's huge. Both of us work nonstop during the week. I'm doing the artistic element, she's doing the business part. The amount of detail to get this done is incredible. The figure in the middle is full photogrammetry. This figure is now in the round. It was not in the round before. So that's a photograph, and we use the same model that we had used in the initial drawings, except now it's three-dimensional. That will now get chopped when I work from the life model next year. This gives you a sense of scale. It's on the ground now here, but it'll be slightly higher when it's cast and shown. So that's the battle scene that arrived with the green is the clay on top. You have about two to four millimeters of clay, and then this is pure milling with no clay. This is the studio with the battle scene. And that's that central figure representing Dan Daly. This is a Native American that I showed you photographs of before from the Cherokee Nation. And this is my special tool, a $1.25 Kmart brush that I bought, does the trick. So it's not the tools, it's what's in your head and heart and in your education. And how what you know, your education, creates your reality through your perception. So we put the composition together, and this is the, how many, first 18 figures. And it's really interesting, because I haven't seen anything like this lately. And I'm really excited to share this with you tonight because I'm hoping this is the beginning of something new in the art world. And so Justin, I want to thank you for having me. And Edwin, thank you for picking me, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still working that out. <laughs> and thank you, Joe, for asking me to be your partner. And also my wife as well, for standing by me. I think if you have too many things going on, it gets confusing, confusing for the viewer. So I needed to come up with something that really, you, you can't handle everything. There's so many different elements. Yes, you could have put the enemy in, but then all of a sudden the story becomes more complicated. Right. So, did, you have to, did you have to sort that out or was that something you made, made up your mind about pretty, pretty quick? It was pretty quick in the yeah. beginning. Yeah, it, it, I wanted to make something that was easily understood by all. And then you have many layers too. I felt if I put the enemy in, you get confusion. Things, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Maybe a silly question, but where does all the money come from? The way things tend to work in, with memorials in Washington is Congress passes the authorizing legislation and says no federal funds shall be spent on this memorial. By the end of the project, federal funds have found their way into the memorial. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, roughly speaking, I'd say two-thirds private, one-third public uh, at this point. Um, private funds have been raised principally from uh, high, net worth, high net worth individuals and foundations. Uh, that have a particular interest in in the in the messaging and, and history history uh, being commemorated here. Yes, right here. Thank you. This may be also a question for Edwin, so I apologize. Might want to. I absolutely 
the location is perfect right by the White House, right by the Treasury, right by the Commerce Department. Can you can you talk about maybe any restoration of the park, of Pershing Park? Because right now, I wouldn't want this magnificent sculpture to be somewhere that um, may not smell the best or have... A, or have uh, you know something this grand be diminished by uh, 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 not a good park? So that's how that's how federal money is finding its way in. So, um, as I say, we were required uh, ultimately under the National Historic Preservation Act to preserve the existing park, which was deemed histor a significantly historic uh, work of American landscape architecture. So much of the design work, much of the you know, but in the process, we're going to have to tear up the park and, and put it put it back the way it was. And so we persuaded the Park Service that a lot of the project is rehabilitating what had gone to, to had, had become dilapidated over the last 35, 40 years, and that we really shouldn't have to pay for that. And the Park Service, with some help from some people on Capitol Hill who we know, uh, agreed. So they're kicking in money in the, you know, uh, under the heading of deferred maintenance. So when we are, you know, when we are redoing the plantings because trees were planted in, in uh, you know, with in, inadequate soil volumes and whatnot, you know, that's going to be paid for by the Park Service. When we are replacing broken stonework, replacing the mechanical, and electrical, and plumbing systems, that's being paid for by the Park Service. The second half of it is the is the maintenance, and so uh, under the Commemorative Works Act, which governs memorials in Washington D.C. The memorial sponsor has to provide a 10% endowment, 10% of the construction cost uh, in a, on, on the top has to be paid over to the Park Service, and that goes to pay for big picture maintenance. Um, you know, a pump break, someone breaks off a, a piece of a rifle or something like that. Uh, there's a lightning strike that you know does something. Who knows what? As to the daily maintenance, which has also suffered over the last 30 years, my day job is with an agency called the American Battle Monuments Commission. Uh, which built Pershing Park in the first place. We built the World War II Memorial. We beat the, built the Korean War Memorial, and we maintain all the American military cemeteries and memorials overseas. And to be frank, we are the gold standard when it comes to maintenance of those sites. If you've ever been to one of our cemeteries, Normandy being our, our best known one, ABMC has undertaken to provide for the maintenance of the site once it's built, uh, because Congress likes us a whole lot more than they like the Park Service. And it's easier for us to get funds for maintenance of a war memorial than it is for the Park Service to get funds for maintenance of an urban park in Washington, D.C. So that's where federal money is coming into the project, and that's how it will be used to make sure that the site you know, lives up to the, to the sculpture that's we're saving go. That the, that, the, that the site honors the memorial that we're putting into it. Um, as you well know, Sabin, there are a handful of uh, very competent World War I sculptors like Sergeant Jagger and Britain, R. Tate McKenzie, uh, a Canadian who worked in Britain, Herbert Hazeltine, um, and actually Robert Ingersoll Aiken, who did the World War I memorial sculpture um, in, in, in Kansas City, but also did interior sculpture. Your work, frankly, is so much more ambitious um, than any of of those projects, um, uh, but did you did you um, do you use those in your memory bank um, as as inspiration as um, um, touch touchstones for for your work? Um, thank you for that question, uh, and it's a really important element to my work that I play forward a tradition that I follow in the footsteps. Um, I did make a trip specifically to London. Um, from the foundry at Stroud to look at um, the Jagger sculpture um, uh, at Paddington Station. And one of the things that really impressed me about it was the proportions of the figure and how block-like they were. And uh, they were reminiscent of um, the cube system that Michelangelo used for a rib cage to give it a very heavy set structural uh, vitality that would last through many, many ages. It's power. But it's also a sense of a static energy that is breathing and living. Um, the other element that was very important from that piece that I really, I was very intrigued by the texture and how the texture was not smoothed over like a lot of what we're seeing today in modern times, but it was applied 
and had a lot more emotion and drama to it. And I felt that was very fitting to a memorial. And that's one of the things that I'm playing forward where the actual application of the clay enhances the story so it has more movement and vitality that gives it a, a ethereal quality. So that Jagger is the one artist that I've really looked at carefully. Um, and, and just a, a caveat for Edwin, um, I've just restored the very first figurative uh, fountain in America, the Nymph and Bittern, the allegory of Schuylkill River in Philadelphia, um, which has been in storage for 70 years. Um, admittedly on view at, in the Philadelphia Museum, but it's effectively in storage. And to my mind, the, the, the most vulnerable part of monuments like this are, the, are inevitably the water features. Because unlike Roman fountains, um, which are gravity fed, the mechanisms and um, it just, it, in this country, we have a great deal of, of problem with the water features. This is a, a very simplified uh, water feature, which should have a better Future, on the other hand, the water feature inside the, um, the National Portrait Gallery Smithsonian Art Museum has been decommissioned. Uh, they've given up um, trying to uh, get that to, to, to work satisfactorily. Well, having, having seen the, uh, the construction drawings, the water system's not quite as, quite as simple as we'd like. Uh, one parameter we did originally put in the competition brief was no water. Uh, because we knew of those problems and, and we knew that the Park Service hates taking care of water. Uh, by the time we got through the Commission of Fine Arts, we have the original footprint of the pool at that site and, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and uh, you know, uh, on the back of the, the sculpture sits on a, on a freestanding wall that's inside, the, you know, within the pool and there's water cascading over the back as well as in front. Uh, and so it's complicated. Um, yeah, well aware of that and, uh, and hence the, the ABMC uh, commitment to maintenance. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't give one update on the status of the project, particularly because my fundraiser, Phil Mazzara, is sitting back in the back there. Um, we're, you know, this is about a $45 million project. We raised about 35. We got about 10 to go. Uh, we will get there. It's a question of when. We are very anxious to break ground on the, on the park itself. Uh, once we do that, in about 12 months, the park will be brought back up to speed. There will be the, the platform for the sculpture will, will be there and we'll put up temporary imagery uh, like the scaffolding you see around buildings in Europe when they're redoing them and they show you what the building looks like. Saban's going to take, Saban says he takes, he's going to take five years to finish this. His wife, Tracy, tells me he's going to take three and a half. Um, She's the boss. Bobby. Uh, will this be lighted during the evening? Yes, we have. <laughs> We have spent a lot of time on lighting design, and that is one of the areas that the Commission of Fine Arts really drilled into, as Justin can tell you. So the lighting, yeah, the lighting is going to be spectacular. Solar or electric? Can I, can I electric. Talk about? We had a, we did a lighting test, um, and this was like fantastic because usually <laughs> sculpture lives or dies by light, and uh, we got somebody uh, who did the lighting for the sculptures at the Met in New York, and. We were on the same page. I wanted lighting that was from above and three quarters so that uh, all the figures pop out from the background and the story becomes even more impactful at night. And from my perspective, it will become more dramatic. And that's the money shot that will be shown when the memorial's done. It's, it's really strong. One, one final question. Just tell us a little about the process, the process of getting all the historical details right. I know you had a lot of help from military historians. So, uh, as, as you know, Commissioner, um, uh, Sabin has worked closely with the American Battle Monuments Commission uh, throughout the process. Uh, our Deputy Secretary, Rob D'Alessandro, our Chief Historian, Mike Knapp, uh, as well as Lip Commissioner Libby O'Connell, who's on the World War I Commission, uh, all bring expertise in American material culture of that age. Uh, and so some, uh, several months ago, Saban came into our office. We went through the entire storyboard of the piece, picked out, you know, every particular area where uh, he needed to be attentive to, to uh, historical accuracy. Uh, uh, Rob and Mike will be coming up to his studio periodically. Um, you know, if he's going to be sending off uh, the first section to the foundry in August, then probably May, June, uh, we'll go up there and we'll just 
walk the length of it and say those buttons have to be changed. You know, one thing that we that we never noticed when the when the maquette was a foot high, but we did notice when it was full, six and a half feet high, was those those cartridge belts that you see. Well, they don't go around these days with a full rack of cartridge of shells of, of uh, bullets in them, and so at that point it became obvious those are deflated. They've got they're going to have to be filled out, and so you know we've already pointed that out to Saban. He's already started working on that, but we are. There are legions of nitpickers out there. Uh, we, we want to silence them, and we want to be faithful to the to the to the troops as they were. So we're putting a lot of attention into that. And, and we we used also um, original uniforms that saw combat. In fact, I found pictures in a Salvation Army uniform that I got from Mike that had uh, pictures from home in it, still, and that adds a lot of the veritas and truth to the project because the cloth actually folds the same way that it did originally, rather than a fabric that's different. Same tooth. Well, okay. please join me in thanking Saban for a wonderful presentation. And you, it, 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 it's a strong term, but I think we might see a masterpiece in the making. Thank you.